So we had Bethel AME Church. It didn't, it was not built here. It actually was built in Black Bottom. So it was, but it was moved here, of course, as everything got moved out of Black Bottom in Paradise Valley. But Bethel AME is a very important church. It, of course, here it tells you in 1839, a group of black Detroit citizens formed the Colored Methodist Society. If you know anything about the Colored Methodist and African Methodist Episcopal Church, you know that Richard Allen in the 1700s, abolitionist in Philadelphia, uh, got tired of being discriminated against in the white Methodist Church. Him and a number of other started the Free African Society, and those members of the Free African Society started three churches. One, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, started by um, Richard Allen. This other one, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, started by Absalom Jones. And the Colored Methodist Episcopal started by James Berry. So you had three, they were all members of the Methodist, White Methodist Church, they were all friends, and they got tired of being discriminated against, they started the Free African Society, and then three churches grew out of that. And so the African Methodist Episcopal movement came to the North, or came to Detroit. And it, in 1839, of course, slavery is still going on. So Bethel and me, after Second Baptist, Second Baptist was the first black um, congregation in the Midwest. Not just in Detroit, in the Midwest. So Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, none of them had black, black led congregations prior to Second Baptist. But after Second Baptist, Bethel and me. And they did some of the same things. But Bethel and me would be much more influential later. So Second Baptist and Bethel and me, very, both very influential churches. But two important institutions come out of, organizations come out of Bethel and me. One, the Booker T. Washington Trade Association, which changed its name to the Booker T. Washington Business Association, but it's the same organization that believed in supporting black businesses and helping black businesses to form and its sister organization, the Detroit Housewives League. One was started by the pastor, uh, Reverend Peck, and then his wife, Fanny Peck, started the Detroit Housewives League, which before the, before the quote unquote civil rights movement started a black buying campaign. Don't buy where you can't work. Don't buy where you're being discriminated against. Don't buy where they ain't hiring black people. And they had placards, signs, uh, flyers, campaigns, and they were um, highly effective. Uh, probably, I would say, more effective than the Booker T. Washington Business Association. Uh, so they were very important. One of the founding members, the fo of course, the leader was Fannie Peck, but one of the founding um, members of the Detroit Housewives League was Helen Malloy, and Helen Malloy is the foster mother of Betty Dean Sanders. You know her as Betty Shabazz. So Betty Shabazz is aunt who became her foster mother was a founding member of the Detroit Housewives League that came out of Bethel AME and so she grew up in the Methodist uh, church and by the age of and by her teen years she said that she'll be a Methodist forever but well, we know <laughs> that didn't quite happen and there was a big conflict between her and her family when she became a Muslim and married uh, Malcolm X of course Malcolm X was well known so it wasn't I mean in Detroit so it wasn't as if her family didn't know who he was, but you know they grew up in this church, so you can imagine how they felt about her marrying Malcolm. Well, she went down south to Tuskegee, and and, she, and even though her um, parents were a member of the important institution, um, she faced true Southern Jim Crow racism when she stepped up to Tuskegee campus because the kids. The students would go to Montgomery to shop. Now, this is Montgomery in 1951, 52, 53. So we know 54, 55, the Montgomery bus boycott. But so this is that same time period. So she they go to so she faced that racism, and so she leaves. Uh, not of course now she's has this bitter experience um, with racism, and she leaves and moves to Brooklyn goes to school in Brooklyn, all right? She, she, later for the South, she goes to school in Brooklyn, where she runs into her, uh, one of her nursing fellow nursing students is a member of the Nation of Islam and brings her to the mosque. And so after she's had this racial, racist experience down South, and this man is telling her, well, <laughs> this, this, this minister is telling her, 
Well, these are devils. <laughs> it clicks. Of course, she falls in love with this man who's teaching her this. And she gets married to this man who's teaching her this. And she leaves um, the Methodist church and becomes Muslim. Sanders becomes Betty, Betty, Betty X at that time. And then she eventually um, has the name Betty Shabazz. And when she makes her high, she's El Hajj Betty Bahia Shabazz. And she gets her doctorate eventually, but after Malcolm is assassinated. Between Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. Black Bottom was a residential district primarily. I mean, there were businesses in Black Bottom, but there was primarily a place where people lived. People didn't live in, in uh, Paradise Valley. It was a business and entertainment district. So you had clubs, theaters, restaurants, hotels. That's what you had in Paradise Valley. It was the happening spot. It was, but it was owned by black people. Because of the racial restrictive covenants, black people couldn't go out there and have businesses and homes. And because the banks didn't loan money to black people, black people got their money to start their business from two sources, the churches and the gamblers in the, in the, in the, um, the, the underground economy. So the people who were the gangsters, who was, because there was no Michigan State lottery. You played the numbers, the street numbers. And the street numbers, of course, in, in, in New York, that made a lot of people rich. If you saw the movie um, Hulum, that was in, in Queen, Queen is a real person. Well, we had, it wasn't no queen in Detroit. It was mainly two, two men who ran the numbers racket here in Detroit. And business owners got their startup money from them because the banks would loan money to black people. So all of them had stakes in club plantation, 606 horseshoe mob. Gangsters were uh, Jewish? Jewish. Uh, there were some Jewish gangsters and some Italian gangsters. But the numbers racket in Black Bottom and Paradise Valley was controlled by black people. That's what you understand. It was controlled by black people. White people could not take control of the numbers racket in Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. And so there was no state lottery. The state lottery in, in Michigan was done partly in response to what black people were doing on their own. The, the big scandal happened when the major numbers runners were controlling City Hall. Black numbers runners were controlling City Hall in the 1940s. In the late 1930s, 1940s. And all the, everybody knew. The police knew. I mean, they were in, involved. The, the media knew. Everybody knew. But nobody said anything. But one of the um, gangsters, one of the numbers runners, um, had a white woman. He had a relationship. He wouldn't leave his wife for the white woman. She jumped out of a window, killed herself on Woodward Avenue. Woodward and, um, you remember the street? No. Woodward and, um, I want to say Adams. Who, who down jumped there. out? The, the wife or the, the white woman? The, the white girlfriend. She was the yes. girlfriend. She jumped out the window. Well, that, I mean, that's bad, but she left a note. And in the note, she tells everything. And so now the media got to cover it. You know, they didn't want to. They knew, but they have to cover it now because she left this note. So, of course, the, the mayor goes to prison. It was probably wasn't the first. <laughs> Mayor of Detroit goes to prison. The two brothers go to prison. They do, I mean, everybody does eventually get out. And the brother gets out and starts a realty company. And they build a whole housing development in Southwest Detroit and make a lot of money off of that. They get out of the, the numbers game and um, make a lot of money off, off, off of that. So, um, but this was a black control business district. How long did it exist? Yeah, it existed roughly 20 years strong. I mean, after 20 years, it still existed, but little by little, it was getting demolished. Uh, a street here, a couple of buildings here, and then of course the last building would go in 2001. So in our lifetime, the last Paradise Valley building got destroyed. And, right over there, right? Yeah, and it was right down the street, right, right when you get to the corner. Um, no, right in this corner right here, where they, they turned to get on the freeway. Remember, that freeway was no 75, right, so right. yeah, that's where the corner was. So, in 1946, Mayor Edward Jeffries came up with a plan called the Detroit Plan. And the Detroit Plan, the number one thing was demolish black body. That was first because white business owners wanted to have business located near the riverfront. 
and they did not want to locate their businesses next to the, you know. So, right. So, because of that, he, that was the first thing, destroy black bottom. And then secondly, because the federal highway money was coming in to build a major highway into the main business district, which would be Paradise Valley, and run it right on Hastings Street. Run it right on Hastings, which they did. So, so they, I'm sorry, 75 runs right on Hastings. It runs, at, it takes the place of Hastings. So where most of those businesses were, they were t 75 took its place. And Ford Field and Comerica Park, took the place of the rest of Paradise Valley. Yeah. So, this is Day Paradise Valley. This is Day Paradise Valley now. And just a little bit um, of, uh, like, 375 and 75, of course, was built to, and destroyed part of Black Bottom. They used, they used um, urban renewal um, ideas Negro and removal. Negro removal, which is what it really means, <laughs> Negro removal. And also, they, they used eminent domain. So the, the, the basically, the city said that we're gonna use this for city purposes and we're taking your land. And almost nobody got any money for this. They're supposed to give you money, but almost nobody got that. So they took the land and then they get, sold it to private people. So it wasn't used for a public purpose. They ain't build no park or nothing. They used it, they, they did build a freeway, but then they sold the rest to developers. And so you have the new version of Paradise Valley happening over there with the with the uh, arena that's being built. McGill is just getting his arena. 400 million of y'all tax dollars is paying for that. And, and when it's built, the agreement, he got the land for one dollar. Got the land for one dollar. The new arena is gonna be right over there. Um, Oh, kind of cat a corner of cast uh, tech and the auto auto abandoned buildings they were really owned by Illich for decades people didn't know that all those abandoned torn up buildings owned by Illich for decades and now he's now he's going to tear them down and build this arena with 400 million of your tax dollars but the agreement is once it's built Joe Lewis arena will be torn down and the new arena is not going to be named Joe Lewis so the iconic name of Joe Lewis, it will be getting removed as well, at least as an arena. But another important part of Paradise Valley is the first Nation of Islam mosque was on 3408 Hastings Street. It was in Black Box. I mean, it's in Paradise Valley, actually. He did go door to door and sell silk. And the person I'm saying went door to door is uh, Wally Farad, who the Nation of Islam refers to as Master Farad Muhammad. And they, they, in, in their religious view, he is Allah in person. He, God came in person. And he, and if you, you, I'm sure you've probably seen a picture of him somewhere. Very fair-skinned man. Some say white, some say Pakistani. And he's, he's, he has a Quran, and he look, he's, he's kind of reading the Quran like this. Hairs, um, I don't know if that's his natural hair, it's real fine and slick down. Even more, I mean his conch is even more stronger than Farrakhan. So, in uh, in uh, in uh, he went door to door in Black Bottom selling silks and other different things from, from the East. And when the people would open the door, you know, he'd be like, these silks, you know, they were for royal people and y'all are royal people. You know, you come from royalty. I, you know, yes, uh, you come from royalty. Uh, Y'all my uncle. You know, the black man is the my, is my uncle, and I came here in this in this body form. I came here to remind you that you're from the lost tribe of Shabazz, and you're here in the wilderness of North America, and that you're the original Asiatic black man and woman. And people start joining, and people.